and we're live for this afternoon's update on the funding of 16 to 19 study programs for 2020 to 2021. This is the latest webinar from eMemoir and the session is going to be led by Beige Ketchmarchik and as ever we like to keep these sessions as interactive as possible so you the participants can benefit or um, feel free to use a question or chat facility at any point throughout the duration of this webinar. You don't have to wait till the end. Um, and if you're watching this on a video recording and you have any questions or thoughts, feel free to get in touch with us and our contact details will be available on the slides at the end. Sessions expected to last between about 50 minutes to an hour. And this depends on the type and volume of questions from you, the participants. Without further ado, I will hand over to Bij and mute my microphone. Keep the questions coming. Thank you all. Thanks very much, then, Manik. Uh, good afternoon uh, to everyone. Good afternoon, particularly to our subscribers and regular customers. And to those of you that might be new to our webinars, hopefully you'll enjoy the next 45 to 50 minutes, find it a value and benefit, and uh, might consider taking up a subscription with us if you haven't already got one. Uh, as Manik says, uh, this is the part of the regular series we do on funding. Today, we'll be looking at an update on the funding of 16 to 19 study programs for the next academic year. And of course, this is all based Based on what we currently know, things might change, and as you know, things might change quite significantly after next week. Um, as I said, it's part of a series. We've been looking at funding for apprenticeships, funding for uh, adult education budget funded programs, as well as looking at the uh, advanced learner loans. Um, I think well, a couple of things just in terms of, um, we, we, we have got some guidance on this, and this obviously came out uh, more recently about what the nature of study program funding would look like particularly after the uh, public spending review and the significant, uh, well, certainly significant by, stand, by, by certainly the standards of the past 10 years, uh, increase in funding that we're getting for 16, 17 and 18 year olds on study programs in England. But also I think what we've got to bear in mind is that this will be the first running of T levels in 2020 to 21. And obviously we'll be incorporating some of the information we have about funding for them. So my start point really is, to, first of all, good news when it comes to study programs. And it's not often we get some good news on the funding side, but the headlines here are quite significant. As we said, public spending, the uh, extra 400 million pounds that's being put into uh, 16, 17, 18 year olds on study programs in England to be welcomed. Um, this is all going to happen in the context of not changing the funding methodology. The way that operates and has operated certainly since 2010 will continue. But I think the big headline for, for all of us is the um, just under 5% increase in the rates of funding for uh, students on study programs, which is taking up just under half of the total 400 million that was allocated in this year. And obviously that's, it is welcome news, but it's enough to make um, all of our programs uh, cost effective. That's another issue and I'll pick that up later on. Where's the other money going? Well, a significant chunk of it, 120 million pounds, and there's the quote, colleges and school six forms will also get 120 million pounds to help deliver the more expensive but crucial subjects. So there's two key issues here. One is the more expensive programs where, for example, the program cost weightings haven't reflected the, the intrinsic cost of delivering an hour of, uh, for example, engineering or catering hospitality, but also a second category, the high value subjects, which can lead to higher wages and ultimately a more productive economy. And that's going to take up 120 million pounds. Now, I'll look at the detail of this and how it uh, is going to impact on uh, some of your provision, particularly the areas such as engineering, uh, catering, etc., manufacturing, transport. But also, I think, just to sort of, uh, in conclusion, maybe raise one or two uh, uh, issues, particularly when it comes to what we call the unforeseen uh, uh, consequences of some of these changes. There will be some additional funding for maths and English, which is uh, to be welcomed, particularly for those level three learners that still need to get their English and maths up to uh, 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 GCSE grades uh, nine to four. The tolerance, the, the, the English and maths condition for study programs will be continued, and the current tolerance level 
So anything uh, within 5% in the value of your learners will not uh, be subject to any reduction in funding. And if it is, it's always at, at, uh, at half the national rate. That will continue. There will be some additional funding uh, in the investment side for the retention of teachers and leaders in the sector. And of course, in addition to all of the funding that's already been allocated to the introduction of T-levels, there will be some additional funding, particularly for early adopters of uh, the level three T-levels and early, any early adopters of the transition frameworks at level two that will be uh, in place after 2020. So you can see that that's uh, good news. The additional investment also that, that's part of the 400 million, there will be a continuing continuation of the money that's there to help you build capacity to deliver industry placements. So that capacity development fund will be there. Uh, but that's not just for T-levels, that's for all students aged 16, 17 and 18. Uh, and obviously includes 19 year olds if they start their programs when they were earlier, when they were younger. And obviously that's also extended to include any learners who are 19 up to 25 with education and healthcare plans. But this is partly for those of you already securing that funding, but also for new institutions that, or institutions new to the CDF, there, there will be some additional funds there. The continuation of the advanced maths premium, which is an extra £600 for each additional student taking a specified level three maths qualification above uh, um, a baseline figure, which will be the average of uh, two years before, um, depending on how much uh, on the data that might be 17, 18, 18, 19. That will continue into 2020 to 21. What is new is the level three program for uh, the, any learner on the level three program who hasn't yet got English and maths at the uh, required level, they will be able to be supported more effectively on those subjects until they get them. And that's gonna be uh, an additional funding. Now that's already in place for T-levels, the, the T-level funding for those learners who haven't yet reached a, a level two in English and maths. Uh, but it will now be extended to other level three programs and, and obviously we'll look at the conditions for that. As I said, there will be some additional funding for the uh, early adopters of T-levels, particularly for the new T-levels that will be in after this first wave. And those are going to be paid in 2020 to 21 uh, academic year in, in, to prepare those new T-levels um, that are going to be introduced in 2021 to 22. And those uh, payments uh, are £30,000 per provider for each T level that they're intending to introduce and £20,000 for each provider if they're going to introduce a transition framework. Uh, and these are all after 2020. Uh, 21 obviously in, is the current payments, but 21, 22 will be paid next year. So the, the basic shape of the funding formula, as I said, remains unchanged. Now, if you look at this, this is for young people on study programs, not, not, not necessarily on T-levels. And you can understand the main driver is still the lagged uh, student number effect, the rate of funding. Well, obviously, these are the new bands. The retention factor is still 50% of the uh, funding that will be lost on the core learning aim if the learner is not retained. There will be changes to the program cost weightings, which I'll talk about. Disadvantage funding will not change for uh, people on study program. The large program uplift will continue to be applied uh, for learners who attain um, uh, four A levels at a certain grade uh, or five A levels at a certain grade or equivalent in the form of uh, the English baccalaureate. Apply to all of that is the area cost allowance, and that's basically your, your program funding. The additional elements which are there, you'll see condition of funding will apply, care standards funding will apply at the same level. This is the last year of application of formula protection funding for both study programs and T levels in study programs. This won't apply after 2021. High needs funding, which is a separate issue, and will be picked up in a separate uh, webinar. We then talk about the, the student financial support. There's the funding for your industry placements and the advanced maths premium. You notice, though, by the way, all of those elements are outside of the funding formula and then not, not subject, therefore, to being multiplied by the area cost allowance, which, of course, is critical for those of you listening in who are from London in the southeast, and that reflects those additional costs. Now, where these new elements are going to be added, 
there is a, a significant one. And I think that, for example, if we decide to include within the funding formula the level three uh, English and maths uplift, uh, then that would mean that that would be applied to the formula up here, so on that top line, and therefore would be subject to area cost allowance, unlike being applied down here, which isn't, uh, doesn't have the area cost allowance applied to it, or the uplift applied to it. So there are important issues about where these uh, new elements will be put. Uh, so that now means that the, the new study program bans for next year, which will apply to all those students who are not on T levels, which will still be the majority, you can see that the funding rates on the right-hand side are the new funding rates that will be applied next year. So you can see those, they, they, they obviously include the uh, just under 5% increase in the basic rate. First question you want to ask is, it, this is good news, but does it reflect what's happened in real terms to the rate of funding per learner, per learner hour, which obviously since 2010 has not changed. So this is quite a significant fall in real terms. And now we're balancing it out with that four, uh, four and a bit percent increase. Only you'll be able to tell by factoring in what's happened to your direct cost per hour. For example, is that still 50 pounds or is it 55 pounds? And what's happened to your overheads um, on an hourly basis if that's more than than 50% uh, of your total cost. So I think that's one of the key questions I can't answer for you, but certainly you will have some modeling that you'll be able to do in your own institution. So those bands will still apply. And remember, this is based on planned hours. Um, uh, and of course, the key thing there is for band five is making sure that the minimum is 540, but the average is close to 600 hours, which is the basis for that uh, rate of funding now being uh, a better rate per hour. Now for T levels as part of your study programs, I think we've covered that in a previous webinar, but just a sort of couple of words, uh, you know, a few, uh, a few points on this slide to, to remind you. Four new bands uh, been added to the existing study program bands to reflect the larger size of T levels. And of course, T levels are, you know, level three programs delivered over two years. So you've, you've, whatever your funding rates are, the rate of funding per year is just half. And of course, they have separate items uh, which are uh, not part of that core funding. So whatever the rate is for the, the T level, there's additional funding for an industry placement, which of course has got to be of a certain size in terms of planned hours. And that's funded at an additional 550 pounds per learner over two years. 275 pounds per year. That wouldn't normally be applied within a study program because uh, any work placement within the study program is part of your core funding that we described there. So inside the 4,188 is your provision for a, 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 a work placement or industry placement, whereas for T-levels it's separate. We also know that unlike study programs where the le level of funding for an 18-year-old goes down, unless they're a, a learner with high needs, goes down to uh, uh, the rate at 4A, which is 3455. We know that that doesn't apply to a T level because they've got the same number of hours reflected over each one of the two years. So it's a fixed number of hours. Now the assumption is for a study program is that an 18 year old will have less hours in the second year because in the first year they would have attained their English and maths GCSE or whatever or equivalent or uh, have done their work placement and need less time in the second year. Now, what is different is that in T levels, there's also an additional funding of 750 pounds per qualification per student if they haven't met the minimum requirement for English and maths. So that is quite important because obviously what it does mean is that some learners will draw down another 1500 pounds, although whether they should be drawing down that if they're on a level three program, uh, you know, if they haven't got the appropriate level of English and maths, there's some question marks about your uh, selection or uh, your uh, process for determining who's best suited to doing a level three T level. Um, now, by the way, that's going to be extended to other level three programs in 2020-21, and I'll come back and talk about that. The other thing to note about T levels is, although T levels then carry the rest of the formula in terms of, uh, you know, the way it's, it's calc the, the funding is calculated, although they will be calculated 
uh, as part of your total allocation. So they will extract those learners who are T-level learners if you've not increased the numbers uh, from your current cohorts. Um, unless, of course, your plan is to increase the number of learners and that, that would then uh, uh, be funded uh, differently. Because in the first few years of the allocation for T-levels, it will be partly done in historic data and partly on your uh, provider plans. The Block 2 funding, though, is different. Block 2 funding, which is a disadvantaged funding based on prior attainment English and Maths, for T-level learners next year will be not £480, but £650 per subject. And that reflects a very important uh, aspect, is that the disadvantage funding, which is really there to take account of the low-cost additional learning support for T-level learners, will actually be assumed to be more because they've got a longer program and a longer placement. Just look at the planned number of hours. So there's a, a proportionate increase in that. The other thing to note is that for T-levels, there's also one-off payments, as I said, for early adopters, £30,000 for each T-level that you're going to be doing, introducing in 2020, 2021 22 and also £20,000 for uh, your transition framework. That's the Level 2 program that you might be piloting and putting together uh, to, to allow progression to the, the Level 3 programs. So... You can see there that the formula, the current formula, and again, of course, not all the elements have been added yet. You can see that the, the inside the formula for um, the T levels, it's actually the same principles apply, although initially it's going to be planned student numbers, and then when we get enough data, it'll be lagged. The rates of funding will reflect those different bands. So we'll talk about the bands in a minute. The retention factor will still be on the core learning aim. Program cost weighting, again, will reflect whatever. Uh, one of the sector subject areas it fits into. This is part of the formula, and so it's already included in there. The disadvantage funding, which includes that block two funding at a higher level, then subject area cost allowance. Then you've got the T-level placement funding, CDF, the, sorry, the funding that's available to you at um, uh, the, the £550 or £275 a year. There's your formula protection, which of course will be the last year of it applying. There's the math, advanced maths premium. And then of course the condition of funding, <coughs> which is any a reduction of funding, but of course that doesn't apply to T levels. Uh, as you can see, there's some notes below that explain that. Remember the T level industry placement funding of 275 pounds a year only applies to students on T levels and doesn't apply to other so these new elements that we're, we're going to talk about will be reflected in that uh, table as well. So these are the new bands. So the, the bands for T-levels, which are going to be the four bands, although I don't think band nine will be uh, seen at all possibly. I can't see from the way that we're designing T-levels that they would get as big as um, that level of uh, requirement of uh, somewhere around 825 hours uh, a year, um, but the funding rates will are already reflecting the increase in rates. So these are the new rates that will apply 2020 to 21, and you should build those into your program planning. So those are the, if I call the sort of changes to the funding rates, which is the first part of what uh, this update's about. Now, what about other components? Well, the second big component is the change to program cost weightings. A lot of evidence, feedback from providers shows that some subjects were not sufficiently weighted and therefore didn't accurately reflect the higher cost of delivery per hour. These are not longer programs, they're just more expensive to deliver per hour because sometimes you've got two staff costs, teacher, technician, workshop assistant, as well as material and capital costs that are implicit in an hour of delivery. So to reflect this, um, there's going to be uh, an increase in some of the program cost weightings by 10 percentage points. Not by 10%, by 10 percentage points. So for example, something that previously was 1.2 will go up to 1.3. Something that's 1.3 will go up to 1.4. But to do this, two new program cost weightings have been introduced. Uh, some programs that were originally weighted at 1 will now be 1.1, and some programs that were originally weighted at 1.3 will now be weighted at 1.4. So these are known as low and very high. 
Now, in terms of the, 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 the sector subject areas that have been increased, transport operations, maintenance, building and construction, hospitality and catering, that'll be very welcome to those of you with the uh, uh, catering uh, uh, provision. They're gonna be increased from medium to high, so from 1.2 to 1.3, and that applies, remember, to the whole of the learner, not just to one part of the learner program. On a study program, it applies to the whole of the learner, right, Other, it, as part of the formula, and obviously for T levels, it will apply to, as I said, those bits that are actually formula driven. This doesn't apply to, for example, like the industry placement. On a T level, the industry placement is always weighted at A. Engineering and manufacturing will increase from high to very high. Well, that's welcome news for engineers. And an interesting thing about A levels in sciences, sciences were weighted at one along with humanities, um, the arts, etc. They are now going to be weighted next year, as long as the program consists of at least two or more science A-levels. So it's two or more. So there'll be a, a, um, an algorithm that works that out based, I would imagine, on um, your ILR data from the past. So it'll be based on some data that's, uh, that's, that's already uh, uh, in the system. And that will be an extra 10% that will apply to the, that learner study program. These, by the way, will also apply to the new T-level. So, so beware of that. So this was basically, and I think this is one of the things that I would certainly have a quick think about. Does it change basically how some uh, departments in your institution found themselves not able to, for example, meet the full cost of delivery? So example, you might have said, well, we want a 50% contribution from science and engineering from hospitality, and the best they could do was 35 to 40%. Well, that would have reflected not only the, 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 the funding rate per hour, but obviously the weighting of that rate as well. So these, I think, could change some of your internal calculations as to what's viable and not viable, and therefore the minimum number of learners. And I think that's the set of sums I would be doing fairly quickly to see what that might change, uh, how might that might change contribution rates from the uh, aforementioned departments. So science, engineering, manufacturing, transport, uh, building and construction, hospitality and catering. And if you haven't done the sums, I think you, you, know, you can just sort of, if you've got an internal costing mechanism, which you know, takes account of uh, program weightings, then you, this would certainly make uh, some of the sums look very much better for those areas. So these are the new uh, program cost weightings. Most A-levels are still weighted at base. Science A levels, as long as the learner is doing at least two, will be low. Some other subjects are still going to stay at low, but you can see that medium includes IT and computing, high hospitality, building and construction, and very high engineering manufacturing. Some of the other weightings will stay the same. So, but obviously, if they've uh, if they've needed to go up by ten percentage points, it will be in those subjects, those uh, sector subject areas that I showed you earlier. And of course, land based will stay at that current rate. So that's going to be the first thing that reflects the cost of a, a program. The second thing is what is, is to do with the value of the program. So this is additional funding to encourage and support delivery of selected level three courses in subjects that lead to higher wage returns, there's some assumptions, and support the industrial strategy to enable a more productive economy. Now these words are quite important because if we're looking at those subjects, and this also extends to T levels, this premium of 400 pounds per student per year that the student is on their program or their T level is quite important because the eligibility criteria is if they're doing A levels, at least two of the selected A levels must be in the right uh, uh, sector subject, uh, uh, sub subject, sector subject areas. And that list of qualifications which will be eligible for this, so this is an additional 400 pounds per learner. Now the key thing I would say is this premium gonna be part of the funding formula or is it gonna be uh, the non-formula bit that appears on the bottom line in any diagrams that we describe? It's important. Um, but I think what is important here is, and I'll show you the, the subject areas in a minute, is that um, I think we've got to monitor uh, provider behavior because we want to see what happens in terms of patterns of first of all offer and partly of delivery and I think the two factors together the change the, the change in program cost weightings and the high value courses premium could have some in very important implications for a 
student choice? Will we allow students to choose things which are not high value? And secondly, you're just simply uh, focusing provision on those high cost, high value uh, areas so as to improve your overall financial position. Given that, you know, that will take up a large chunk of the extra 400 million pounds. So I think we've got to be careful about uh, how we respond and whether some of the unforeseen consequences work through. And I, I'll take that question that one of you has already posed. I will be looking at that uh, as a conclusion. So which subjects will benefit from the premium? In terms of A-levels, there's the list. So the sciences plus electronics, design technology, maths, interesting. And maths, yeah, A-level maths. And now if you look at the other subjects, which will include T-levels, but there is one rule, there's one, sorry, one requirement. There must be at least 360 guided learning hours a year. And that's in engineering, manufacturing, transport operations, building, and ICT for practitioners. So you can see a common theme coming through. So those are two important changes that will take up about, yeah, 120 million pounds out of the, the whole package. But I think I've got very important implications for what your internal systems for working out whether departments are making a positive contribution to overheads or not, or the required contribution, and also to what the implications are for curriculum offer and delivery. Now, a new thing to be extended to all study program students that will be in place from next year is the level three program, maths and English payment. Out of the 400 million pounds, 35 million pounds being set aside to support students on level three programs who haven't yet got the GCSE English and maths grade nine to four or equivalent. So it's basically to give you a little bit more resource to help them reset their exams. This is not to be confused with a disadvantage funding, block two funding, which will be still £480 for a full-time student, which does take account of prior attainment in English and maths, but is not for the delivery of English and maths. It's basically your low-cost additional learning support funding, which could be used for a whole range of uh, additional needs. So the eligible students will attract the single payment of £750 per subject if they're studying a two-year programme. So that's a commitment to a two-year programme or £375 payment per subject. So, it, you know, this is per subject, so per English and per maths. So you'll have to work out how many are likely to be covered by that if they're studying a one-year programme. Now, the difference between a one-year and pro, someone says, well, if I've got a programme that's not two years, but it's 18 months and a day, is that going to be a 750 payment or a 375 payment? The answer is if it's 18 months and a day, it will count as a two-year programme. If it's less than 18 months, it will count as a one-year programme. You know, that, that's some of the detail. But what is important is the students must be eligible. First of all, they must be on a study program consisting of at least two qualifying A-levels from those, uh, you know, from the list of A-levels that are eligible to be funded for young people or enrolled in a study program, including at least one level three qualification with a recommended GLH of 360 hours or more or a T-level. So basically, this is there to fund those learners predominantly who are going to be doing two-year programs. Uh, but it doesn't exclude those learners that might do everything in one year. Uh, but again, it's uh, what's going to be eligible will be uh, 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 something that's already eligible to be funded as part of the study program anyway. So this extends beyond that which is already available to T-levels, I think, and I think that's important to note. Now, other elements of the formula, um, a lot of this is going to remain the same. The large program uplift, which is, uh, you know, adding either 10% four, uh, of 4,188 or 20% of 4,188, um, uh, that will increase uh, uh, in line with the uh, uh, national funding rate. But again, remember to, to earn it, the learner's got to be uh, to have been on the equivalent of uh, four A levels, which they have to pass all at least at grade B to get the 10% uplift and 20% will be five A levels or equivalent. The condition of funding is gonna stay. We're gonna require learners to continue studying English and maths if they haven't yet attained a GCSE uh, at, at grade four to nine. Subject obviously to the relaxation and those learners who will be better if they progress from say a grade one to grade two and then you know through a, um, a, 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 
stepping stone qualification and then not be required to then do a reset at a higher level. The only group, of course, that will still be required to reset GCSE were those who got a grade three. Uh, and that, of course, condition of funding will apply the same way as it has done with the same tolerance, so no change there. The disadvantage block two funding will remain unchanged at £480 for full-time students, the equivalent for part-time learners, and the block one rate for care leavers is also unchanged at £480. Don't forget, for people on T level, block two funding is £650. The funding rates for any 14 to 16 year olds will continue to be aligned with those rates, so they'll go up. And uh, you, you obviously, those of you who are doing 14 to 16 provision, you get your um, uh, funding allocation for that in after the, the new year based on what you're actually doing in terms of your, 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 your current level of provision. So you can see that the, the main elements of the, the way that the retention funding works, the way area cost uplift works, doesn't change fundamentally. Neither does block one uh, disadvantage funding based on postal codes. So, what I think this raises is some important questions about uh, if these are the changes to the funding formula and you've got to meet certain conditions to uh, uh, generate the right evidence for, for example, any funding claims you make, the basic rules don't change. Uh, learners have got to be eligible in terms of age, etc., etc normal residence conditions, etc., And the program has got to be eligible. So it's got to meet the requirements of um, the uh, ESFA in terms of the types of programs and the types of uh, uh, qualifications that are part of that program. So those basic rules don't change. The English and maths condition still applies for those learners that haven't yet attained GCSE grade four to nine. There are obviously some exceptions for learners with uh, SEND, um, and, and obviously you've got to bear those in mind. And of course, don't forget that the English and maths condition, the English condition can also be met by some students following an ESOL program, which would be a better program to follow, hopefully with then progression to uh, a stepping stone in English. The other thing is that some of the conditions of funding require that for the learner to get that additional funding, for example, for English and maths, they have to be on a level three program. Whether there's gonna be any uh, additional funding for T-level learners on transition programs at level two, that obviously has got to be seen uh, uh, as important, uh, uh, as something that we will look at once we get more guidance on that. Um, but also be aware that, that you know, it's, there's only limited amount of funds here. And if we do uh, increase the funding for one group of learners, uh, it will often mean that funding isn't available for another group unless the totality of that funding is increased. And up to now, there has been additional funding for T-level development as well as T-level delivery. Conditions of funding for disadvantaged funding will still apply. Obviously, postal codes, 20% um, most deprived postal codes for Block 1. Block 2 will continue to be prior attainment in English and maths as a proxy for... Um, uh, low cost additional learning support. I've already mentioned a large program uplift because that's only uh, uh, eligible to be funded if the learners meet the condition in terms of four A levels at grade B or equivalent. And that's what they've actually achieved, not what they're studying. So it's, it's, it's after you've got that data in and five A levels are equivalent for the 20% uplift. The retention factor will still apply, but um, in terms of the core learning on study programs, and the core learning will be defined by you. It's usually the biggest element in any program. Um, but also to note that for T-levels, the retention rate uh, initially will be based on your organization's average retention rate. So if a person is not retained on the T-level, then how much you, uh, you, you know, what we'll do is we'll, we'll apply the average retention rate to work out what uh, the impacts will be on your funding level. Reconciliation of uh, actual uh, take up of T levels against plan T levels, uh, plan T level numbers. You've got some guidance of that in the documents that were published at the end of summer. Um, the other thing to note, by the way, is audit requirements will still continue. You know, planned hours will still be the key focus. And that's why I always go back to making sure that uh, we, we get all our data 
right. Now, to some extent, the sources of data for 2020-21 is just rolling forward everything from 1920. So, for example, for the lag student numbers, the advanced maths premium, the extra £600 you get for every learner above a baseline uh, number of learners will always be based on your data, your recent, most recent data. Uh, so, ILR, R04, and that will be moderated by obviously any data that we get uh, uh, from uh, uh, the, the R06 uh, uh, information that becomes available, uh, particularly if that uh, uh, cha changes your average number of learners that will be in the lag number, uh, uh, num uh, in lag number for funding purposes. The young persons match the Minister of Data 2017 to 18 for the large program uplifted. So what were the outcomes from the 2017-18 cohort in terms of the number of A-levels or equivalent that they attained? We're still using local authority data for high needs element two place funding uh, for FE institutions and individual and independent learning providers. Obviously, element three is what's coming through on actual learners that have to be attributed to a, a real learner in, uh, sorry, a named learner, not a real learner, a named learner that the home local authority is willing to fund as being high needs. We know that we'll use your ILR outturn data, that's for 2018-19, uh, which you, you submitted in October of this year for program size, full-time, part-time, funding factors such as retention, program cost weightings, disadvantage funding blocks one and two. And similarly for condition of funding in English and maths and the industry placement money uh, that you're getting. What's going to be confirmed is how the high uh, value uh, uh, pr uh, cost programs, the high value courses uh, premium is going to be paid. So there's an extra P in there, which we've got to remove, uh, the, the middle one. So the high value courses premium, uh, that's those subject areas that uh, will draw down additional funding, and the level three English and maths, but I would imagine that's going to be similar to what we're going to do, uh, intended to do, uh, and that would be certainly part of the formula. Um, so I think that, would, again, would be based on uh, 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 data that would be collected through the ILR. On T levels, of course, some of it is uh, uh, historical data, so it's driven by the ILR, and some of it, obviously, is your provider plans initially, and we know that allocations there will reflect both. So those are important uh, sources of data to meet conditions uh, and determine your actual funding levels are quite critical, and obviously we'll see more information on that in the new year. When you get the, uh, your funding toolkit, and you can model what the implications would be of these changes. So, but the other thing to note is there are still issues with the audit of planned hours. I'm, I'm picking this up from recent financial assurance uh, reports that there's still incorrect recording on the ILR of the split between planned qualification hours and planned employment enrichment and pastoral hours, which actually then determine whether you're in the right band. So all those bands that we talked about, it's still important that you get that, uh, uh, those data errors out of the system. So planned hours must be relevant to the study program or the T levels, planned and timetabled by you, supervised and organized by you, including, of course, the work or industry placements. Within the normal working pattern, although what is that for a delivery of 16 to 19 provision? For example, in one of our cases, we deliver study programs over seven days a week. So normal working pattern for us has to reflect the needs of the sector that those young people are working in and going into. Got to be part of your quality assurance as well as resourced and incurring a cost, even if that cost, in some cases, the cost of uh, uh, blended learning materials or different types of staff. And I won't rehearse some of those uh, uh, arguments with you. But I think what is important is that that understanding of the cost drivers, of uh, the drivers for cost effectiveness in study programs and T-levels is still there. So even though you might sit down and say, well, this is good news, I think by the time you start looking at how the changes that have been announced for 2020-21 affect the cost effectiveness of your whole study program offer and then different parts of your study program offer. So what is it? what's the impact on engineering? What's the impact on A-level sciences? I think you end up with very different sums. But we can see that five factors do bear here, that even though there is an increase in the money value of 
the each hour that a learner is undertaking, in effect, you've still got to manage cuts in real terms funding. And what that has meant in terms of types of staff, class size, etc. I'm sure you 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 know you you're already aware in your own in organisation. The relevance to the labour market becomes increasingly important because of if you're offering programmes which are high value uh, course courses which attract a premium, they're very relevant to the needs of the labour market. That's great. That's certainly going to make you know extra resource come into your organisation. But what's the impact on things like uh, student choice on the social and educational needs of your communities rather than just the relevance to employment needs. How innovative will all of these changes make you? Will you introduce new ways of delivering, you know, flipping the core, blended learning, you know, using all kinds of different ways to deliver uh, a quality cost effective study program? And of course, not only that, if you look at the quality of the curriculum, a key driver has now got to be the new education uh, uh, um, inspection framework, which gives a much greater emphasis on the quality of education that a study program is in terms of what is the intent, how do you plan it, how do you sequence it, how do you implement it, what's the actual experience that the learners have of their A-level or level three program or the level two program in terms of sequencing of learning, uh, building that uh, long-term working memory and all of that is quite important when you're looking at uh, effectiveness as well as, as efficiency and, and you've still got a condition to meet which is the English and maths condition which has great impacts on all aspects of delivery of your study programs uh, as well as obviously um, the impacts on the outcomes that you're getting so what's the impacts that, uh, of, of your study programs in terms of improvements in, in students English and maths skills and, and, and knowledge. So you can see a fair number of drivers there coming together that will still have an important impact. Can I just ask, have any of you started to model the impacts of the changes in, in the funding formula for your next year's delivery of study programs? Let's assume that you have the same size, the same number of learners next year as this year, although that might not reflect things like changes in demography. But have any of you started to factor these into your planning? Can we just ask that question? Just a show of hands, how many of you who is listening in have actually already started to factor these changes in to your plans for next year? Just a show of hands. Yeah. Not yet, too early. Not many. Not many. Okay. But I think what's important is that you, you'll be shaping your offer in terms of what's going to be the curriculum offer for next year uh, to get those um, early uh, uh, promotional and marketing materials out to schools, etc. And, you know, the sooner you, you, you reflect that in your um, engagement, the, the better for you in terms of future uh, recruitment. Of course, you don't want to preempt some of these things, uh, you know, and, and certainly the influences I think will be uh, more internal than external initially. The reason I say that is because when I started to look at these and the implications for, I mean, you know, as a director of a training company with, a, you know, about 200, 300 learners on study programs, we've already started to think, well, what would be the implications, for example, on the, could we therefore say that uh, some of the costs that we're currently bearing are now going to be re we're going to get compensation for within the chain the, the, the increase in the rate of funding however a, a lot of our provision doesn't actually uh, earn any higher program cost weightings or any of the high uh, uh, the premium for high uh, value courses so that, that obviously doesn't affect us as much as it might affect someone that's delivering, say, engineering, for example. So I think the rates of funding do reflect an increase in the, real, in the cost of delivery, but I don't think they reflect the real cost. Because if you think about the last 10, the night, last nine years, what's been the increase in your average cost of providing an hour of a study program is not going to be met by a 4.7% in one year. 
The second question, which I think I've already started to hint at, but I think it's, it's one of these unforeseen con consequences, is will this have an impact on the breadth of programs offered for student choice? Now, if a lot of your students want to do art and design, uh, performing arts, etc., or health and social care, which, which doesn't necessarily reflect high value programs in terms of wa wa wages, where's the double pull? Do you meet learner need or do you meet the needs of the economy? And I think that's particularly part of your mission is, you know, and our mission is to be comprehensive and inclusive and all learners will try and meet their needs. But this could have an unforeseen consequence. Also, where's the quality and diversity impact measure for these high cost, high value programs. I'll give an example. In one of the institutions I'm associated with, the majority of uh, 16, 17, and 18 year olds on the high cost, high value programs are, are males. So we have very few uh, girls going into engineering, transport, construction, ICT for practitioners. So, you know, that could have another unforeseen consequence in that it, it creates that that split in the amount of resource that's, that's being earned by certain learners and therefore might have impacts on uh, the way in which we uh, meet, meet, make the, the, the programs available to those learners. It shouldn't do, uh, particularly if you're, you're, if you're focusing on making sure that all learners have, uh, uh, of, are, are treated of, as of equal value and therefore get the very best quality of provision. But that could be an unforeseen consequence. The other thing I've still got as an issue, will the extra funding for T-level programs make them viable in terms of class size and contribution rates? Because even though the funding per hour per learner is still around the same as for a study program at 600 hours, about you know, £6.67 before the 4.0% increase, which would possibly bring it up to about £7 per learner hour, is that enough when you've only got seven learners in the class, you know, or eight learners. I mean, if I don't get, if, you know, if any of the people I work with don't get, say, 14 or 15 learners in the class, even if they're doing T levels at these higher rates of funding overall, it wouldn't necessarily mean that those classes are viable. So I think there's still big issues about the initial few years of the introduction of T levels. Will we have big enough group sizes to, to be able to make that provision viable, as well as meeting the expected targets, uh, and then you know the the impacts on on uh, how the ESFA will view your plans in future. For me, one of the biggest issues there a lot of the emphasis on it today has been on level three programs, you know T levels, the level three English and maths, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. What about our level two learners? Which in in one case, I'm the governor of a medium sized college. That's our single biggest cohort on study programs. And although there's going to be a wee bit of uh, improvement there if they're in some of the, uh, the program cost weightings, we're not getting the same impact as we would have certainly got if we'd switched a lot more provision over to T-levels. So I'm, I'm very worried about the transitional um, arrangements, frameworks for T-level learners, as well as what that might mean in terms of the amount of resource that's available for our most prevalent learner. The other thing that I think that even though it within uh, the the uh, allocation, you know, the, the, there is still the assumption that uh, you'll make provision for learners with special education and or uh, uh, dis disabilities needs, is that even within the T level, there is some provision for it, for example, relaxations, et cetera. Uh, it's the high needs funding and the availability of high needs funding, but also is the proxy known as block two disadvantage funding enough to cover the real cost of supporting some students with SEND who are not high needs learners? And we have major concerns, particularly with uh, a lot of learners with much more complex needs, with uh, mental health needs, whose additional learning support costs are well above the sort of figure that we've uh, assumed as part of the low cost allocation. And it often means um, that uh, it, it, it could also mean that uh, there isn't enough for those learners out of that block two funding if their needs are closer to 6,000. So, you know, you're talking about some of them are costing four and a half thousand, five thousand pounds. We've got to fund that out of block two funding because they're not technically high needs learners. A good point that one of you made, by the way, thank you for that uh, question, you know, a comment. The new hourly rate appears to work out, as I said, at about just under seven pounds per hour, even with the increase. And I don't think that's going to cover 
a lot of the um, the viability costs of T level certainly. Um, and especially in the first instances, if I'm running you know, T-levels in two program areas and I'm spreading my 20, 25 learners over two, where's the viability? That's clearly uh, going to be a major issue. And that will obviously impact on what we then do in terms of saying, well, rather than offering three T-levels or two levels, we'll just offer one and make sure that that, that uh, uh, is, is viable. So there's a, that issue as well. And I think the other thing is that with... T-level programs and, and generally study programs themselves, but any programs which start to extend beyond that 600 hour average, is that uh, will we have enough in the discretionary learner support budgets? You know, it's not just about learning support, it's learner support, and particularly those elements of it which are discretionary, and those are being stretched as well, as well as any match funding you might be getting from other areas. So I do think that even at these early stages, even though we haven't got the final formula and we haven't got the final, you know, modeling that you need to work out what your allocation is going to look like next year, and you'll get those toolkits uh, very soon uh, and of course there is an election which might change everything you know um, but but I don't think uh, it, it's too early to start doing some of the modeling and thinking through the consequences and I know certainly those of you who are early adopters of T-levels will have already done that so these are just some of what I've got as the, the concerns from a provider point of view not just concerns, but maybe questions that still need answering about the planning and delivery of study programs, even with this updated uh, information that we've got. I don't know if there's any other, Manic, any other implications that any of you might have thought of, having looked at the update doc, the update in the funding and what was announced as part of the the, the consequences of the spending review in in uh, October, November, and we're working with that. Uh, and you can assume that those are going to be part and parcel of your uh, allocations. Are there any other things that you maybe have come up with that you think I haven't considered as a potential implication of the uh, new funding arrangements? Remember, the formula is going to stay the same. The allocation system is going to stay the same. T-levels will be originally you know, a mixture of planned uh, numbers, and then eventually more and more of it will be based on lag number effect. Any other things that you have considered maybe specific to your type of provision? Anything we've missed there? Any other thoughts? Good opportunity now to, uh, to perhaps share them using the question or chat facilitate. Uh, indeed, anything that we've missed. And if you're watching this on a video recording, again, if there's anything you'd like to share them. Obviously that's right. Free. That's right. Thank you for that, Mike. Just a reminder. We've got Maybe. a question, a point from one of you. Most of our learners are on art, design, health and social care, performing arts provision, uh, humanities. And therefore, we're not going to see a lot of these benefits, whereas neighboring organizations, which offer a lot more of the others, will see a, a significant increase. Well, that, that, that redistribution of funds still occurs within an envelope that pays more because there's 400 million pounds more for the whole sector. But as you said, there'll be different winners, uh, relatively different rates of winning from it. I think that's the point you're making. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that, that, that has got important consequences. I think you're right. I mean, the national rate going up by 4.7% benefits us all, but by the time you've topped it up by some of those other things, it's quite a significant change. Yep. Any other points? Well, if you've got any other questions, obviously pose them to us. Um, you know, we've got our contact details there. If you're, you know, not got a subscription with us, then get in touch with us there for 30 new webinars, it's a minimum of 30 new webinars in a 12 month period. The current cost is 250 pounds plus VAT. So it's basically working at 10 pounds per webinar. You can give us information about uh, what you might think are good titles for us to cover. We'll certainly be looking at um, study programs again in a bit more detail once we've got the allocation data and you might want some uh, um, information on that. And also we'll keep you informed about what's happening on T-levels, both in terms of funding, but also in terms of content, quality, et cetera. Um, the impact of the new education inspection framework on study programs. Yes, we'll be looking at that. I'll make a note of that, Marek. EIF Super. Uh, implications on study programs. Yep. Brilliant. And there's one of you asked for something on the tut tutoring role in study programs. Thank you for that. That's given us advice. Uh, we've got another comment. Uh, where are traineeships in all of this? 
<laughs> it's a good one. I mean, obviously, traineeships will still be part of your study program offer. You know, uh, and don't forget, traineeships are um, uh, just shorter study programs. Many of the learners would be part time. So basically, you just go back. I'll just take this liberty to go back into your funding rates. If you look at study programs, they would be in one of those bands. So, for example, if you're running a study a traineeship of around 400 hours next year, that learner would be £2,827 if they were retained to the end, or they at least completed the work placement or progressed to a, 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 a an apprenticeship or progressed to a, 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 an FE, a substantial FE program. Remember, all the conditions for earning the retention funding on a traineeship uh, are all to do with uh, the person either staying on it or getting a job or getting uh, an apprenticeship or going on to an FE program. So traineeships would be funded in the same way. A traineeship, all traineeships are weighted at A, so there would be no impact uh, in terms of any of the uh, program uh, weightings, that we, program cost weightings we talked about. But some of the other things, uh, remember traineeships are not at level three. Traineeships are either uh, they're always below level three. So obviously there are some ways in which traineeships won't benefit from some of the other changes. So thanks for that question. Good question. Thank you. Any other questions? That's great. Okay. Oh. Can we uh, close the recording down now, Marek? Yeah, absolutely. I was going to say, pop the final slide on with your, your contact details and there you go. Feel free to get in touch. Please, that was fantastic as ever. Thanks for your contribution uh, for all the participants there. Uh, for everybody else watching on the video, feel free to get in touch. Thank you. That's great. Thank you, everyone. Thanks.